So welcome to week six of the next level presented by Pathstone Enterprise Center and the Small Business Education Institute. Big thanks goes out to our sponsor, KeyBank, for allowing us to come into your living rooms, your offices, your, uh, your, ho your uh, home office every week. So thank you, KeyBank, for allowing us to do this. And uh, this is week six, halfway point. We're halfway done. And with that halfway point comes an announcement that um, we are always excited to talk about, graduation. So graduation is coming up at the end of our um, workshop series here. And anybody who attends at least six classes gets to graduate. You will be invited to graduation. Um, you'll receive a certificate. And we have uh, something special planned for that as well. Um, for those of you who are going to be graduating, um, we will need your headshot and your bio. For those of you who graduated from boot camp, if you, want to, if you want us to just use your bio and your headshot from that, we can go ahead and use that, but you need to let us know. You can let us know in the chat if you'd like, um, but we'll make sure that we, uh, we use that. So, um, and you don't have to do the, it doesn't have to be the first six classes or the last six classes, just at least six classes over the 12 weeks. Um, you need to attend to be invited to uh, graduation. So, and we'll have more information on graduation in the coming weeks, but it's here, it's now, uh, it, it's coming up. It, we're just a few exits away from it, guys. So, um, but this week we're here right now, we're gonna be talking about Porter's Five Forces, and we'll talk a little bit about rules of engagement, um, just to get started here, if I can get my technology to cooperate with me. There we go, okay. So talk about, a lot about engagement every week. The best way to engage with us is through the chat feature. And we always, that way we always have a record of everything. Um, speaking of record, you're going to have a record of this. We are going to have this available on YouTube. We're going to have this available um, via email to you. You'll have the, the copy of the slides as well as the YouTube link. So you can go back and watch, uh, watch the presentation, watch the class. And um, you'll have all that in your email by the end of the week here, usually within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours after the class. So just uh, keep an eye out for that. I have to manage the waiting room. There you go. And um, the, if you're not comfortable communicating with us through the chat, feel free to come off of mute, say hey to us, and um, uh, speak to us through your microphone. If you're not using the microphone, if you're not speaking, we do ask that you mute the microphone. It kind of kills some of that background noise and that static, and we would really appreciate it if you were uh, willing to kind of just turn that off. Uh, same with any kind of distractions going on behind you on the video. If you're if you got um, some some kiddos running around or whatever, and you you don't want them to uh, distract you or distract the, the rest of us, um, feel free to turn your video off. Otherwise, we'd love to see your smiling face. Um, you can invite the kiddos into the class too. So um, I know that I was on a a call on Friday, and there were a bunch of kids in the background, and it uh, it was fun. They were excited. I was excited, but uh, I paid attention to nothing in that class. So. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if, if, if when you are talking, make sure you have your speakers down. Otherwise, there's going to be some feedback, and that gets uh, – it, it's like this never-ending loop of, of something we've said, and it just kind of goes back and forth, this long echo. And um, But now we'll get into kind of our announcements. So Next Level Virtual Workshop Series, week seven is next week. And, uh, Mr. McCarley, what are we, working, what are we learning about in – week seven of, of next level, what can we get people excited for for next week? <laughs> well, we're going to work on the excitement associated with the projections that a lot of people have a tendency of putting together. And these are not just if you're applying for a loan, grant, whatever the case may be. These projections also really tell you a lot of what you need to know about your business, more interesting, what you are looking for to have happen with regard to your business. So we're going to actually talk about projections in a slightly different way of doing them. Wonderful. Thank you. That's, projections are, they seem scary, but they're fun. Um, I love them. I will be there. I will be learning. I will be um, totally tuned in. So I invite you guys to join me. Join Mr. McCarley on Monday next week for week seven. We're talking about projections, talking about money. Um, and that's one of the key reasons we're all here anyway, is money. So um, make, uh, making a new life and a better life for ourselves. Uh, also, Friday, October 30th. So next Friday, we are having our, 
what I believe is going to be our final small business forum of the calendar year. We're talking about revving up your re revenue and increasing your sales during the holiday season. So as we come into the final uh, two months of the year with November and December and all the holidays that, uh, that lie therein, um, we are going to talk about how you can increase your sales during the holidays, whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit. We're going to talk about that in ways we're going to have a, uh, an excellent, um, excellent uh, host for that and a great expert there to talk to us about uh, a great marketer and somebody who can talk to you about converting your sales. So that'll be exciting. We we'll also have a, um, a new podcast, and I'll let you guys hear a, snip, a snippet of that in just a minute after Dion talks about the, uh, change, the, yeah, change the Game Free event for small businesses through Capital Connect. So, Dion, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about Capital Connect and uh, the event we're putting on that next Thursday. Great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I really encourage everyone before you um, matter of fact, uh, I'm going to plug this link in the chat right now. Please sign up for next Friday's Friday Forum. We're excited to bring you a new member of our technical assistance provider team. Her name is Rochelle Edrington, and she is a sales and marketing expert. <clears throat> uh, as Adam said, and here is the registration link. Plug in the chat here. So go there, sign up. If you're interested in how you can, if even if you're a nonprofit and you want to know how you can market your ad folks are taking a look at their bank statements and if they've got disposable income they need to write off before the new year begins, maybe your nonprofit is, is the place they'll donate to. And for those of you who have for-profit businesses, this will be hugely helpful as well so you know where to focus all your energy and your resources so you can maximize your sales for the holiday. The uh, Change the Game Capital Connect event is, as it says here, next Thursday at 3 o'clock. And it's uh, going to be a, a collaborative event with uh, local, local to Western New York, small business development experts. And these are all members of a consortium of CDFIs community development financial institutions like Pass on Enterprise Center that are coming together uh, uh, with uh, assistance from JP Morgan Chase to provide Western New York small businesses with some information on uh, grants and funding opportunities that are available to you. So for example, the uh, Erie County Economic Development Organization has a PPE grant program. PPE as in protective uh, personal equipment. So if you need to buy masks, uh, gloves, you need to retrofit your, your storefront, uh, this is a grant that is available to you. Uh, they will also be taking you through uh, the um, details of the new $20 million back to business grant that was just announced last week by Erie County and Michael, uh, who's on the call today, uh, will be uh, hopefully at the event and we'll talk more about the specifics of the grant. But this is a great opportunity for small businesses, whether or not you got funding from PPP or IDLE, uh, this grant is available to you. Uh, additionally, there is the New York Forward Loan, which uh, within the last few weeks changed its criteria. So it, uh, anyone who got a PPP loan was excluded from applying for the New York Forward Loan, but they have now since adjusted that to include anyone who got 50000 or less in PPP loan. And one of the CDFIs uh, who will be on the call with us, Pursuit Lending, uh, is actually one of the, the um, 
uh, lending institutions that is uh, providing these loans, the New York Forward Loans. So we urge you, there is something there for everyone, whether or not you think uh, you, you might not qualify, I suggest that you register and you attend that event. So thank you, Adam. Thank you, Dion. And you guys may hear some uh, construction work in the background of my headphones here. But um, yes, yeah, so please uh, sign up for those events, the Change the Game event, as well as the Small Business Forum. Next week, Thursday and Friday, both those events are available and they're free to you. So please come and uh, hang out with us and learn a lot and learn about how you can improve your business through um, revving up your revenue, increasing sales, but also how to take advantage of some of those emergency relief programs that are available to us. So, and then Deandra, I saw your question about grants in Monroe County. We can get uh, some information to you on uh, the grants we know about, and then we can get you in touch with um, some folks who may know uh, more about those grants. So I will, um, I'll make a note of that and we'll go back through the chat and, and get with you after the, the call, Deandra. So thank you for that. All right, and this is uh, our uh, fun announcement for us. Jahida and I worked on this uh, for a bit. And first off, Jahida did the graphic for our brand new podcast, The Profit and Loss, the Profit and Loss Podcast. So uh, Jahida, thank you for that. And I'm going to let you guys listen to uh, about a minute of the uh, just a trailer here, so you guys know what you can expect on Profit and Loss. You guys are going to be able to find it anywhere you get podcasts. It's out on Spotify, Google. Um, It'll be out on Stitcher and SoundCloud. It's coming out on Apple Podcasts in just the next day or so. I may get an, uh, uh, an alert here today that it's come out. So I'm going to let you guys listen to this trailer for just a minute. Hey, everybody. It's Adam from the Profit and Loss Podcast, presented by Capstone Enterprise Center. I want to tell you a little bit about what you can expect to hear every week right here on our show. For 30 minutes a week, we're going to come right into your headphones with stories from entrepreneurs and small business owners. They're going to tell you about their successes and their failures, their wins and their losses. They're also going to share their dreams and their fears, what keeps them up at night, but more importantly, what gets them up in the morning, what keeps them going. And hopefully, every week you leave our podcast a little more inspired and a little more motivated to start your own journey or continue. So join us here every Wednesday for 30 minutes and leave a little more inspired. The Profit and Loss Podcast from Pathstone Enterprise Center. Cool. The, uh, the sound is certainly not that muffled when you hear it uh, directly from your own speakers. So, um, but you know, that's, that's what we've been working on and uh, we'll have one, uh, a podcast every week. The first one came out last Wednesday, so it is available. Um, I think the easiest place to listen to it is probably Spotify right now. So wherever you, but um, soon it'll be available wherever you get your podcast and you can check it out on our Facebook page. You can find that link. Uh, we will also include it in the follow-up email for uh, today's presentation. So speaking of today's presentation, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to ask Dion to call on a couple of people to introduce themselves. And we have the script up here, guys. This is the script that Mr. McCarley has, has put together for when you are, you know, how to pitch your business to somebody. And go ahead and use that. And let us, um, let us see what you've got. So Dion, if you wanna call on a couple people, even if I know we've got a, a, our group is pretty tight today and I think we all know each other. So, um, but I, I think this would still be a great opportunity for people to practice this. Oh, you're absolutely right, Adam. A great opportunity for people to practice, to hone their pitch. Uh, but I would like to just open it up. Uh, if you are uh, open to sharing with us today, just take yourself off mute, say hello, share a little bit about yourself and about your business. As Adam says, the script is on the page there. Come on, I noticed somebody wants to talk about their business. Y'all know I do, but I always <laughs> do, so I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I always got something to say. That's you know, give them a heads up, give them a lead, give them a lead, show them how okay. it's done. 
Yeah. I'm going to do it off the cuff, though, because every time I read it, I stumble. But my name is Shayna Broughton, and I am the founder of Our Mommy Village Doula and Lactation Services. I help um, mothers in the Buffalo area um, that are in marginalized um, neighborhoods to um, educate them on birth, breastfeeding, and postpartum. Um, I spend more time in postpartum after mom has baby because uh, baby gets checked out way more than mom and we kind of leave her high and dry. So I um, work on skill building, um, adjusting to a new baby in the house. I help with um, the strengths and weaknesses that she may have, um, the strengths mostly because um, of the village itself, um, who's around her and how we can help more um, when I'm not in the home. So when I leave, um, what is her plan and how is she gonna be taken care of? Um, so basically just making sure that mom is secure so that she can take care of the other responsibilities that she has. Cool. Mike, what do you think? Can I, can I give a shot here? Sure. All right. <clears throat> this is not me pitching my own business. I, it is my own business, but I'm not trying to promote myself here. My name is Adam Tidrow. I am the uh, founder of DudeWise which is an establishment engaged in helping busy professionals relax a little bit. The business was born out of the observation that there was a need for ambitious, driven people to uh, kind of unwind and unplug. And one of our solutions is, uh, yeah, one of our solutions is to uh, provide content to busy professionals that is engaging, but not about work, not about growth, not about um, self-improvement. We accomplish this by pr uh, posting podcasts, videos and uh, articles and this uh, this results in people feeling a little more relaxed and having a safe place to go to just read about movies and uh, movement and exercise and how to just be a more relaxed uh, girl dude or guy dude thank you adam thank you adam thank you shana uh, ariana I know I said I wouldn't call on anyone today. I was just wondering. No, you're Hi. good. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ariana. I am the founder of Walking Wonder. It's an establishment engaged in finding business and classy shoes for our women with the big and wide shoe sizes. Um, the business is born because they were um, because of the ob observation that. Uh, there was a need for women who had a larger size shoes to still um, ideally get those styles that your your normal seven and eight and six size shoes would have. And so um, I really wanted to create this business um, to kind of shed light onto the world um, and know that there's beauty and the power of big feet for women. Uh, <laughs> and I am a, a walking testimony for that as well. And one of our solutions is actually currently a startup, so it's not, it's not um, pretty right now, uh, but I thought I'd join this webinar to kind of um, get more insights about how I can um, take it to the next level, so yeah. Thank you, that is fabulous, that is fantastic. It's sort of how I feel about petite sizes. All the clothes that I love are never in my size. <laughs> petite sizes are just so humdrum style clothes. And uh, so I totally understand. And I just absolutely love it. I love the idea of niche markets, focusing on uh, specific uh, groups and needs and, and filling those needs. Uh, in a way that make people happy. That's great, just love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, before I turn it back over to Adam, uh, by the way, welcome to your first workshop, Ariana. I hope that you will get a lot out of today's workshop and that uh, it will motivate you to return next week and the weeks after. Before I turn it back over to Adam, Uh, I would like to ask, how many of you have DBAs? And just type in the chat if your business entity is a DBA. Latoy, good. I see you say you have a DBA. Carmelita, you're a DBA. Deandra, you're a DBA. 
Lamar, you're a DBA. Sherelle, you're in the process. Alfonso, you're a DBA. Ruthie, DBA. Kiana, wow. It seems like a majority of, now, when I say you, uh, you have a DBA, I mean that that's your business entity. You're not an LLC and then you formed an LLC doing business as, but you're solely a DBA. It seems like the majority of people on the call today are DBAs. If you are interested in changing that, thank you for sharing that, Ariana. If you're interested in moving to the next level, this is about getting you one step further to that goal, right? If you are interested in, in uh, going from a DBA to an LLC or S Corp, Please type in the chat and let us know. Ruthie, great. Good to see you wanna take that next step. Anyone else, if you are ready for that next step, please type in the chat. Great, I got you, Ken, I understand. <laughs> I know you are, Shana. Great. All right. Uh, well, it, um, I think most people who are interested in taking that next step have responded. We will be in touch with you. Uh, if you've, if you, you have until the end of this uh, workshop to think about it, and even after the workshop is completed, if you, if you think about it and you decide that's the next step that you want to take, in uh, launching your business or growing your business, please uh, send us an email. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, thank you, Dion. And now I'm just going to um, to be a to be a hip person, a hip young kid. I'm going to alley oop it over to Mr. McCarley here and give him hosting privileges. Um, so, Mr. McCarley, week six is all yours now. All righty. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good. <laughs> Keep saying good morning because I, I, I'm functioning on a totally different time clock. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing? Hope we're doing well. Let me do this. So, as usual, always want to make sure everybody's doing well. You will notice we are now in week six. We're gonna talk about Porter's Five Forces. I don't know if anybody actually went and looked this stuff up last week about Michael Porter and who he was. And I'm not gonna give a real long history uh, on Michael, but Michael uh, was a professor at Harvard and he happened to do a lot of writing about competitive advantage. Part of his writings also led to what were called the Five Forces which industry has a tendency of dealing with or that are imposed upon industry overall. One of the things I made a comment on in week one was the fact that a lot of what I teach, I'm going to pull from an industry perspective because a lot of this stuff can actually be brought down to the micro business size uh, to which everybody on this call really is. You're, you're making under $5 million, you have less than five employees. So you really kind of qualify in the micro enterprise environment. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today, be very clear that the word industry might be used, but I'm also talking about small business. Because what impacts the industry ultimately impacts all the businesses that fall within that industry. And so therefore it impacts you. I also made a comment, and I believe it was last week, that there are three elements that exist in Porter that we're more commonly familiar with, especially when it comes to doing the business plans as it were. And so part of that is actually taking, <clears throat> excuse me, actually taking a look at um, those three elements as a summary, but we also are going to take a look at a larger component of it, and the larger component 
actually has a tendency of being two other elements that we think nothing about, nothing about, but they impact us regardless. So can everybody see my screen, by the way? Give me a thumbs up. Also give me a thumbs up if you know, you're know you a part of what's going on here or put it in the chat that you know I'm available, I hear you. Now there are two little side notes I'm actually going to make comment on. And one of which is, it has come up again and I think at some point in time, because even though this is an educational session, one of the things also here is the fact that you guys are really transacting business. So I think at some point it would be nice for other people to see also who you are. So, I mean, I get the bad hair day and eating lunch or breakfast and things of that nature. But I think at some point you should show your face just so other people can see who you are. Uh, because one of the things that also has a tendency of happening is the fact that sometimes we don't even realize that as a neighbor, you may be living next door to me that can provide a service that I actually need. So please keep that in mind. And I'm, I'm going to start mentioning that more and more because, again, I mentioned I had a good friend who was on here who was a buyer. And as a buyer, one of his things was, you know, I don't do business with people I can't see. So you might want to keep that in mind. Um, just saying. So as what I always start with in the beginning of classes, where do you stand? Mentally, physically, financially, and spiritually. And at some point, some people are going through greater shifts. Those numbers will increase. Some of them may dip once in a blue moon. But I want you to be honest with yourself about where you're at in that particular profile. Where are you at mentally, physically? You know, one is, you know, kind of a lot like today is really overcast, cloudy, things are moving slow. Believe me, we all get that. It might be a 10, you're doing backflips. Then you get up, lift your hand and command something to be done, mountains move. But I want you to definitely go on and put that down or at least definitely note it for yourself exactly where you are. And this is something for now, because we're doing this on a weekly basis that works as time goes on. However, I think you want to at least do it once a month just to check to see where you're at. Now I got a couple of people making notes. Good, good. And again, where are you at from one to 10 within each category? And if you're not doing so well, that's fine also, because it gives you an indicator of what is exactly going on. So while the people are kind of filling the rest of this in, and please fill it in guys. I got a couple of notes in here, but I definitely want you to make sure that you understand where you are at. So for most of us who were here last week, what we primarily talked about was the success formula. And one of the bonuses I felt that I kind of gave people was, you know, in preparing your projections, which we're going to again talk about more next week, preparing the projections uh, is kind of an interesting thing because the projections normally are laid out in a format of a cash flow statement. And as opposed to strictly using income statements and balance sheets, most financial people or investors or anybody that has a wherewithal and understanding of business wants to kind of get an idea of where you're at, what you're doing, where you think you're going. And those projections are a part of your planning your future. But the projections that I actually do, and I'm trying to get other people to do as well, use the success formula 
to set a goal for where you need to be. Because I know many of us are trying to move forward. We're looking to purchase that home. We're purchasing a, uh, another vehicle, quote unquote, for the business. Not the Cadillac or Range Rover just because you ride around on Sunday afternoons. And to actually take a look at where you're at, what you're doing. And as long as you're providing a relative service for individuals and you are needed, believe me, the money will come. So just as a quick review, the success formula primarily was the addition of your retirement and your lifestyle. And the lifestyle is how much are you spending on an average monthly basis for your family? Now we can play back and forth with that number. If you have a significant other partner, um, spouse, you know, they may be picking up half the bills, but I tell this to everybody. If you're going to go through the effort of running a business, then let's make it so we understand what all costs are involved so that we cover everything that is necessary and so then when we get to that point, we are covered. COVID-19 provided one of the best examples of why success formula and beginning to move forward with it really kind of works. Because a lot of people I've strangely enough come to understand that they're not even clear on what their, their, their lifestyle expenses are. And these are gas, light. Yes, you have a home, but you're paying a mortgage, right? If you've got a storefront, or don't have a storefront, if you needed to get a storefront, are you in a position to put down first month's, last month's security deposit actually on a commercial spot because you know you just don't have any more space in your home? Or I actually talked to somebody doing a renovation to their house because they needed to change what was going on in the home to make it more feasible for the clients they actually had. So again, adding lifestyle and retirement. Now, most people don't think about it, but unless you happen to be an LLC or an S Corp or a partnership or a C Corp, whatever money you pull out of the business yourself as the owner is not deductible. So as a DBA, you know, you and the business are one and the same. That's really kind of nice. However, when it's all said and done, and again, COVID is a new thing. One of the interesting changes that occurred with our federal government was the fact of actually recognizing sole proprietors. And so in recognizing sole proprietors who are DBAs, who had never been recognized before, had an opportunity to get a hold of some funding to help them kind of get over the hump. Needless to say, I'm not going to tell you why one third of most of the minority businesses that I either know personally, are part of my assistance network, or part of the groups that we actually dealt with, were not able to actually get that money because the profit at the end of the year is normally the money that goes to the sole proprietor. Therefore, it's assumed that that is their quote unquote pay. Many people didn't have that. They're too busy trying to show a law so they don't pay taxes. I'm telling people, get over it. The profit is one of the best things that can happen to you as a business owner. And if you're smart and you are actually connected to the appropriate resources, your profit can be managed. And so, you know, look at that consideration from where you are from a legal standing as a DBA, like I said. Part it off for those individuals that are looking to move into the next step. And, you know, my suggestion is you, you move out of the DBA stage. It will serve you better in the long run. It really will. But again, we're adding, you know, retirement and lifestyle. Oh, the other thing is a DBA, you don't pay into quote unquote social security. So if you're not paying into social security, whatever you're going to get when you finally retire is probably not going to be enough to handle, you know, how you're living now. And that's the pretty, pretty much the basic guide. So along with the before success, we put these two elements onto it. It now becomes a success formula and it's a goal. This is enormously important. This is a goal. It is a part of the planning. It helps you to facilitate how many things do I need to do? How many people do I actually need to see? How much product do I actually need to move? 
So we're moving forward, people. Don't you hear the drum roll in the background? I hear the music. Okay. So I also talked about bonus material and part of which was this. I said that it is a goal. One of the things about the success formula is the number seems so high that quite honestly, if you were going for a loan and you were to actually use that number, your banker would probably not believe the numbers first of all, and really would wonder where you got them from. And I need to make it clear to people that especially when you're looking for, for investment, but definitely if you're going to a financial bank or a non-bank lender, the reality ultimately gets to be your numbers need to be need to be reasonable to them, but you need to understand truly what it is you need to do to truly, truly be successful. Truly be successful. Yes, Lamar, I, I don't care who it is putting their numbers together. The whole aspect of putting the stuff into projections, whatever you come up with, with regard to uh, the success formula, you divide it by three. Now, when you start actually reaching the goals that the success formula really just kind of demands, it won't be necessary to, to use, quote unquote, the success formula, but it'll be a long time for that because my thing is this. I said there are four uses of business funds. Can anybody tell me what they are? Four uses of business funds. And I bring this up every once in a while. Okay, Shannon, no problem. We love you, good luck. No, there's no such thing, good skills. And we will talk to you later. So what are the four things that business funds are actually used for? Anybody, put them in the chat or come off a of mute. Operational expenses happens to be one. Expenses, yes, happens to be another. Operating debt seems to be the third. If I didn't know any better, I'd think Camilla was, uh, Camelita was actually looking off her notes. And you. <laughs> yes, Adam, yes. So those are the four items. And they come in this particular order, people. Employees, operating expenses, operating debt, and then you. And if you can pay you what you need to live on, not extravagant, extravagantly, but comfortably, and all the other stuff is actually being handled, trust me, you have a business that's actually doing very, very well. So again, this is, a, this is a slide from last week. You know, you're gonna make 40, almost 49 grand a month. Is somebody actually gonna believe that, especially a banker, because you're trying to get a loan to leverage the business? They'll probably say no. But if you bring it down, divide it by three, and you use your original numbers that you use, because the only thing that technically changes when you change your revenue number is actually the cost of goods sold. If you happen to have a business, i.e., especially if you're retail, your cost of services is actually a percentage of the relative revenues. That's the only number that normally changes. Your expenses don't change. The operating debt that you had didn't necessarily change. But if you divide that number by three, so we from 49 pretty much to under 16, or excuse me, under 16 and a half. And so when putting the new statement together, you actually have enough money. And this 43,000 figure on the bottom here, this net profit before taxes, one of the things I mentioned in one of the other classes was retirement. So you need to begin to consider the establishment of some type of retirement for you. And in this particular case, retirement happened to be three grand, which means you still have a couple dollars left over in the end. You have two sets of books, excuse me, two sets of books, one of which is, of course, internally to the business. 
because there's money that we sometimes spend in small businesses that IRS does not allow some of the stuff as a matter of deductions, but we need to be very clear and aware of this stuff. And so you submit one set of books and information to IRS and you have another set for you. And even when you're actually putting together your business plans or investment package pieces, okay, you are clear, you are clear on the numbers that you need to have to make the money you need to make to pay the expenses you are responsible for in order for you to be able to move forward and live in the future. So does everybody get that? Any questions? Give me a thumbs up if you understand. Give me a yes, I do. Tell me you're with me. Tell me Michael, you're confused. I'm, yes. Michael, I'm with you. Um, can I actually, can you actually go back to the first slide so I can like screenshot um, the complete formula really quick? No, you mean, you mean this secret formula? Yes, that <laughs> secret formula. There you go. Thank you, I got it. You got it? All right. And as you know, again, at the end of this presentation, these are actually being put up. I believe it is on Facebook. It is also on YouTube. So you can actually go over these sessions again that I've actually talked about so that you get greater clarity of a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with here, okay? All right. So today, and again, in the beginning, this is a slightly different format. Everybody should understand their story. And the story is inclusive of, again, their introduction, I am. The position I hold is this. My company does this, and that was based on the NASIX code, North American Industry Classification System. Everybody should know what that definition is. They should know what that code number is. And but more interestingly, the description of what the company does, you take the first sentence of the NASIX code and that normally will qualify. And instead of establishment, is this business does this. Other thing too, and I've heard this from a couple of people um, historically, when you talk about your business, do not talk about it like it's I. Talk about your business like it is a, a, an entity which is beyond just yourself. Because that also is a clue. You know, if you talk I, then people are like, oh, okay, you're the only one running the business, so you may or may not be able to deliver the services that I'm looking for. But if you say we, or the business does, there's not a specific indicator that you're the only one running the business. And believe me, you're probably doing everything. But nobody else necessarily has to know that. And when you're on the internet in particular, nobody knows if you're large or small. All they're interested in, are you able to deliver to me the product or service that I saw that I felt that I either wanted or needed? And then there's the observation, of course. And the observation primarily was why the business was started. What need was it that you ran into either because of work or walking down the street or your personal life situation that's actually coming to play, which you know, drove you to suddenly that, that light bulb moment and, you know, this needs to be done and you know what, I'm going to do it. And as a part of that, if anybody listened to Adam, he used specifically the term the solution. You know, how are we going to make it work? Now, you only need one thing because this entire platform here in front of you can be done in 30 seconds or less. 30 seconds or less. That's all you need to begin to hook the person in so that they can ask more questions about what it is you do. And you can set up that appointment and have even a longer conversation of what you do, but more interesting, how you might help the client solve their particular issue. And again, the solution that you have that you're initially introducing people is something simple. You know, because of what we've observed, our particular solution happens to be this. And how do we accomplish that particular solution? Well, we do this, this, and this. We have a checklist. We have 42 items that we actually follow so that we create, create consistency with regard to the delivery of service to these individuals. Or our product does um, this particular piece and so that it is so effective, we make sure that we deliver it to you within 24 hours. That's how you accomplish a particular solution. And then the result of course is, is it's your wow factor. What does your client say about what you're providing to them? Are they satisfied with it? They're happy. 
They, they, they learn to levitate when they never did before and they're floating across the floor. These are the things that get people kind of interested in what you do. Because when you do this, you immediately can figure out whether or not the person really is interested in what you have to sell or they're not. And that person normally can recognize immediately, maybe you don't have something that I really need or I think I need, unless you're really good and your business pivots and it just so happens that on a part-time, you actually do something else that can solve their issue. But that's another story for another day. So this particular week, and I'm gonna start off with, with Elon Musk. Um, how many people know about um, Elon Musk, Tesla? Give me a thumbs up. Note it in the chat. How many people we got that know him? I've heard of him. Okay, cool, cool. Got a couple people. Okay, I got 20 people on this webinar and I got like six, seven responses. Come on, what's everybody else somebody else has heard about this elon musk elon is the the brain child for tesla motors considered brilliant quite honestly by most a person that does not let an idea stop what it is that he's trying to accomplish or what he's put his mind to but i happened to pick this up from a reading that i did this week and I thought it was quite interesting because it actually almost backed into an analogy I try to use once in a while for some classes I had before. But part and parcel is the fact that his ability to learn is not based on just what's being presented. It's based on he tries to connect it back to something which is bigger which is deeper, which is more solid. But the term that caught me is said that most learners today are not gardeners, but they're stick collectors. We walk around life picking up tidbits here and tidbits there until we have an arm full of sticks. And then once we get a bunch of sticks, we do what comes natural. Wherever there's a pile of sticks laying around, we burn them, but we think that the size of the fire is the size of our learning. Elon has built his particular structure on the fact of a simple concept, fires burn out. I want to say that again, fires burn out. And so when we learn the things that we learn about the industry, about the business, about our competitors, we want to make sure we take that information and we are planting it in rich soil. We want to make sure that, you know, and I put down here sunshine and water, uh, of course, are included, but we, we, we've got to learn another way to build upon what we have. There are too many people who are not intending their businesses to be hobby, but if I actually had to go back to some of IRS's definitions, a lot of us are doing hobbies, but we need to really be careful about that. If we're doing a business because we have to, if we're doing a business because we need to, if we're having to do a business because we recognize there's really a need to, then we need to try to create the longest running type business out there where you get up every day and there's butterflies in your stomach and you're not so sure what you're going to do but you need to get yourself, you know, an alliance of individuals that you can trust and network. You pick up the phone and, you know, I don't want to be bothered with you today. And I, I know you don't, I know you don't, but I got this question, you know, I, I got a million dollar contract. What do I do with it? Work it. Work that contract. Make that money. And I'm not saying money is everything, by the way. Money is a tool. Let's also be very, very clear on that. Money is a tool. And in order to build a house, you need some tools. In order to tear some stuff down, you need some tools as well. But money is a tool. And when you learn how to use that tool appropriately, that tool should grow. Grow, i.e. as in multiply. 
multiply so you have more tools to actually use. So you can begin to build not just a kitchen sink, not just work on a kitchen, not just build the back stairs, but you're constructing an entire house. And at some point that house may actually need an addition. We all have dreams. Our dreams are not necessarily going to be totally accomplished by our charms, our good looks, or our wits. We might need a couple of dollars to help us on the way. So as long as we keep that in mind, I think we'll be pretty good. All right, let's get to the five questions here. Again, I said Michael was at Harvard, wrote this big piece. Matter of fact, he's written several pieces. But competitive advantage is one of his more interesting writings. Enormously complex from a reading standpoint. But if you can actually get through it, you get to understand that there are several things you deal with as a business. Now, I'm warning everybody right now, I'm looking for participation in this session. So I'm asking a lot of questions and I want people to tell me whether you recognize this stuff, you don't, have you heard of it before, whatever the case may be. And I'm going to start with one of the things I said beforehand was three of these we should be almost familiar with. Rivalry, or this is just competition. Customers. We don't think of it from a power perspective, but this is a part of our marketing platform. You know, what customers are we going to get? What, what demographic are we actually using? Suppliers. Who's providing us with what we have? to actually go out there and to sell. These are the familiar ones. These are the not so familiar ones. Threat of new entrants. Is there somebody else that can come in and do exactly what you're doing? And more interestingly, is there somebody else that has a product that's not exactly like yours, but it can be used as a substitute? Prime example, water is a substitute for Coca-Cola. Now, nobody thinks a lot about it. Nobody wants water, but you might be surprised. Water isn't water anymore, is it? Water is flavored. Water, it, 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 water is a lot of things nowadays. It has taste. Tastes like the tropics, you know. Tastes like your, your, your best perfume, you know. Toilet water, which is really a, a, an expression from the French, was nothing more than a form of fragrance that was added with water, perfume, and a little bit of oil so it stuck to your skin. But water has changed dramatically. And whoever thought we'd actually pay for water? So again, these are the five forces here. Power of the suppliers, power of the customers themselves, new entrants, substitute products, and your competition. So anybody familiar with some of these, especially the first three that I talked about, customers, suppliers, and the industry itself, put it in the chat box. Or give me a thumbs up. Folks familiar with this stuff? And anybody that's done a business plan should also be familiar with some of this. By the way, side note, business plans are not stagnant. They're supposed to be living documents. They will change when things change in the business. So again, threat of new entrants, threat of substitute, bargaining power of the customers. Can anybody tell me of these five pieces, which one is probably the most interesting? And like I say, people can come off mute if you want. I like I like to hear people's voices. Hey Simone, how you doing? I got one in here for rivalry. What else I got? The customers. Yes, that's all. That's all. The customers. All right. Yeah. Any anybody else? What we got here? And the substitutes. Okay. Got customers. What else I got? 
Got some customers, customers. Rivalry. Who's that? Threat of substitutes. That was Sydney. Substitutes. Okay, Ruthie. Customers. Okay. It's interesting because I noticed nobody happened to mention the threat of new entrants. And the threat of new entrants is probably the most interesting of all of these. Now I'm not gonna read through all of these that I actually put into play, but these are points of discussion. In this particular example, they talk about prof profitable industries, but I'm gonna say any business whatsoever. Is it easy to get into the business that you're actually in? And I'm gonna tell you from a statistical standpoint, most of the businesses in which we actually engage, unless they have to engage a high end of technology, anybody can do them. I used to have a side joke. My side joke was, I can take a five-year-old and get them into business. But I need a reasonable thinking adult to actually run one. So I'm going to say that again. I can get a five-year-old to start a business. But I need a reasonably thinking adult to run one. And so whatever you have, is it easy to get into? There's just low, low restrictions. I don't have to you know, have a PhD to sit around and sell rocks. Low entry aspect, I don't know how many of you actually remember pet rocks, but I use that example a lot because quite honestly, anybody make a million dollars selling a pet rock? I gotta pay attention to. But pet rocks, that's a low entry. Anybody could have gotten some rocks, could have gotten twigs craziest thing in the universe made a heck of a lot of money on it but it was a it was a low entry low entry to get in anybody could do it as opposed to you know i i, I need authorization from the nuclear regulatory authority that that's 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 a high entry fee that's it's high to get into that that's difficult not everybody's going to actually do that so we have to keep in mind, not only our competition that we know or we think of that's actually in play, but we also have to pay attention to the fact of folks that are constantly coming in to our particular industry that they're all competition. Probably one of the most interesting low entry components is anybody selling stuff online. So I say if you're selling it through, what is it, like Spotify or whatever, come on. All I need is a computer. I'm already tying into a, a base program which already exists. All I gotta do is pick some products, find some email addresses, or get some more that come off of Google or whatever based on my particular use of the tools that Google has. And all of a sudden you're up and running and selling. Some people have their own products they're selling. I knew a young lady that sold hair. I was amazed, amazed at how well she actually did. Because I knew some other people that couldn't sell enough hair to sit around and get baby uh, formula for their children. That's how bad it is. But this one woman was just knocking the socks off it. But again, what was necessary to get into it? Well, I need a laptop that actually works. I need to be able to get on the internet. I need to now be able to access, you know, webcams, Zooms, WebEx to actually get my education. And I can sit back as a source of funds, a revenue stream where I can sit back and people are buying stuff even as I sleep. First time I heard that, I had to laugh, but then I got to, I got to understand what that meant. 
And that is, that's another, you know, revenue stream. But there are other things that people need that are not necessarily, quote unquote, always going to the net to get. They need a person. We are people. We're not ghost entities. We're not shadows of the night. We are people. We need human contact. We may not want to bother with anybody, but we need human contact. And so, again, the business that you get into, how difficult is it? Threat of substitutes becomes one of the other pieces that's enormously interesting. Do you have something that somebody else actually has? And quite honestly, it might be better, but it's of a similar product. And this particular example talks about a different use of technology, okay? But the bottom line, it comes out to the same end. You know, meat, poultry, and fish. What used to be landlines, for those who actually know about them, versus, you know, cellular telephones. I made a joke a long time ago about, is anybody in their grandmother, great-grandmother's house got a phone that's actually attached to the wall? where the wire actually comes out of the wall to plug into the phone, not like the remote units you got now. People 60 years ago would have never imagined cellular telephones. And now they're not even just cellular telephones. They're walking laptops, walking computers. No beer for wine. Like I said, water is a substitute for Coke. So do you have something that somebody can substitute? And everybody who's doing online selling, there's always somebody else that if they don't necessarily have the same product you do, they've got something different, but they're competing against you, which by the way, we'll get to in a minute. Now, everybody should know this one. The bargaining power of customers. And what's the most interesting thing about customers? Nowadays, anyway. Customers are not loyal. They really aren't. Can anybody agree with me or most of you got loyal customers running around? They hear your name and hear the business name and they run to you because, you know, they, they will stick you, stick with you, do or die. They be selling frog's legs and they just stick with you. People are not loyal. And the reason they're not loyal is primarily because there are other people doing pretty much the same thing you're doing. Now, you might be able to get somebody to stay with you by the creation of a loyalty program. You know, stick with me, buy so much, you get some uh, benefits or whatever. Now, Lamar, you're in a situation because, which I think is kind of unique, and I could be wrong. Um, I see our esteemed Anthony Dixon is on, and he might actually have a comment about this as well. But Lamar, you're doing landscaping. So if nobody else comes to your customers and says, we do landscaping as well, and they say, well, I already got somebody. I got a young man, Lamar, that's doing it. The first thing that comes out of their mouth is, oh, well, do they do this? Do they do this? Do they do this? Oh, they do all that. Oh, do they do snow plowing in the winter? Oh, I don't know if Lamar actually does that. Now you got somebody stepping on your foot. And it's not your fault because you're doing landscaping. You're trying to build that particular company. You're trying to make that strong. But somebody else comes along and they happen to add something which is actually in play. And that's just the first step. Snow plowing is an interesting piece. As a matter of fact, if you've actually noticed, there are many landscaping companies that also do snow plowing during the winter. Hint, hint. So I'm just saying, Lamar, you can go and pull some of that money out the doghouse in the back and get yourself a plow on one of your trucks. Don't rush, brother. Don't rush. Get the, let's get the landscaping down. You can do that next year. But be aware of folks that can come in and knock on the back door and also provide services that you might not be able to provide. And the thing about it is, and let me make this clear, it's all right. You don't have to sell everything in the world to the customers that you actually have. Just be very good at what you do sell so that your customer potentially stays with you. 
And in this particular time, because of COVID-19, one of the most interesting things has gotten to be, what do I do because I don't have any customers? And my question to you would be, why don't you have customers? Why don't you have specific clients? You've been around for at least five years. You should have people that you pick up the phone and say, listen, listen I'm still around. I'm still here. What do you need? I can still provide certain services for you. I may not be able to touch you, and unless you've got that kind of business, like massage services, that, that, that's, a, that's a nightmare. I, I, I got seven or eight individuals I know that do massages, and they were just going mobile, and that, that, that just flatlined. But what's the alternative? The alternative is to pivot and to start talking about what are the things I can do to relax myself? Can you help me or teach me how to do that? But your customers have enormous power. We really shake and cringe when our customers start saying that, well, I can get it for cheaper up the street. How many people have actually heard that? Give me a thumbs up. I, I, I can get the service cheaper someplace else. They're selling at a discount down the road. And you know what I say to that? Okay. Well, it's nice talking with you, but I, this is my price. And when I hear people who say that, there's one or two things going on. Either they really understand how much it costs them to provide that product or service, or they're just being an a-hole. And quite honestly, I, I have and hope that it's because you know how much it costs you. Everybody wants to provide something cheaper for the customer. You can't provide cheap for the customer until you actually understand how much it costs you to sell what you have. Does that make sense? Anybody? Talk to me. Does that make sense? Anybody got any questions on that? Thank you, Anthony. We have to know what we're doing. And even if we don't know what we're doing, you better know your numbers. Anybody that watches Shark Tank, well, that's one of the first things. Good point, uh, Ruth. But I'm gonna tell you, some people don't even care whether or not the quality of service is actually there. There are some people, this is why I talk about loyalty of customers. They'll go for cheaper just because it's cheaper. Use it once, fall apart, they don't care, is because it was cheaper. Which is enormously unfortunate. But know your customers like you know your product. All right, uh, we'll see you next week. Know your customers, know your product, know your numbers, know what you can and cannot do with what you have. Wow, I'm about to seriously mess up. Uh, Miss Edwards, how do you pronounce your first name again? Ariana. <laughs> Ariana, 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 okay. Ariana, I want you to stay on with me for a second. Okay. All right. So you started this business doing the shoes. Your customers are very specific, are they not? Yes. Okay. Are there any, are there any businesses out there that can provide a substitute for what you're actually trying to do? Um, yes, um, they definitely can. Um, one would be, um, well, one would be primarily, let's say, Designer Street Warehouse. Um, that would be a substitute. Um, yeah. Because if you shop online, since the uh, my business is, on, is online, there are certain stores where you can just find online shoes. However, and I don't want to keep on talking too much, but however, 
um, I found that like doing research that it's hard to find a one-stop shop that you know completely that there are these type of shoes. But um, also another one would be Long Tall Sally. They also have a shoes as well. And yeah. Um, and then there's also, like you mentioned before, like a threat of new entrants, I mean, entrants um, or people because um, once individuals start seeing that, they can also provide or want to have a new extension of shoe sizes. And so, yeah. <laughs> okay. So entrance, you hit There are some people that potentially can substitute or have a substitute quote unquote product. But let me ask you this in particular, as a substitute, is there something other than quote unquote the shoe or is the specially based on the size of the shoe? Or is it the aspect of certain styles of shoe? Yes. So the, the certain style of shoe for the shoe size is where there's a need. Um, anybody can get the shoes or heels, you know, for a larger size. They may not be as cute or in stock, but a specific um, style for a specific um, size of shoes is, is where the need is. Okay. Had you ever thought about doing a little design, by the way, uh, find yourself a manufacturer and get Damon Johns to help you out? I definitely am look, looking into it. <laughs> definitely look, looking into it. All right. Keep that plan in mind, by the way. All right. So, again, just in that particular example, customers, substitutes, new entrants, and Ariana, that's a new business that she's got. But she is clear on that fact. But now what happens to this particular piece? The power of the suppliers. Suppliers are really interesting. Nobody thinks a lot about them. I can get a can of beans, can of peas, can get some corn, can get some rice. But if I'm making something in particular that requires a particular type of rice, long grain versus short grain, if I'm actually going to the farm or actually a slaughterhouse to get my meat as opposed to getting it out of tops, there's a pressure associated with the type of product being sold in particular or if you're manufacturing, definitely raw materials. But it's an interesting piece, if you notice on the bottom, it says if you're making biscuits and there's only one person who sells flour, you have no alternative but to buy it from them. Suppliers can refuse to work with you. So whoever is providing the particular product, especially those who are selling product, if there is somebody else who's selling that type of product. Now, for my people online, we are very, very clear, most of us, that, you know, you've got the Koreans, the Chinese, who are making products. Most of them are knockoffs a lot of times, but they're out there. But it's amazing. Where do you go to get $500 million worth of stuff that's knockoffs? The purse industry was, was the biggest thing. Anybody that's been new, in New York and they're actually walking around looking for a purse and they, they think it's a Fendi, uh, hate to disappoint you, it may not be, it may truly be a knockoff. But suppliers are everywhere. They are everywhere. And so you also need to be aware of who is your first and who is your secondary source for what you are actually selling. And for some of us that provide service in particular, we really need to be careful because we may be buying products that we use as a part of our servicing. Laptops are a prime example. You know, what, what do I get? Do I get an Apple? Do I get an HP? You know, Commodore is not even around anymore. But that used to be a really, really, really good freaking laptop. One of the first, actually. Now I got HP. I got, who else is there? 
Dell, people trying to position themselves in the marketplace, either deal with businesses. A lot of people are coming out of the, the consumer side of it. LG. Anybody that's got a consumer electrics, uh, electronics company pretty much sells everything from cell phones to, to freaking computers. But their power is based on, I can upcharge you for anything you have. And if they're the only supplier you've got, you don't look around, you're gonna pay that price. And guess what? When that price increases from them, it naturally increases to the customer. Does everybody understand that piece? When your rates go up, they, they should be because there's a product or service that you're using to help your particular client and you just have no choice. You gotta go up on your prices. You gotta go up on, does everybody get that? Let me know that everybody's kinda of understanding that. All right. The one piece we should all be familiar with is, of course, this last piece. Competition. Who are we competing against? There's direct competition, by the way, and there's indirect competition. Now, non-internet speaking, well, that's a little difficult. Direct competition actually used to be somebody that was possibly within a mile of wherever you were physically located. Indirect competition used to be anybody on the outside of that or it took them at least 10 minutes to drive to your business. That has dramatically changed. Because of technology now, direct competition and indirect competition is a blurred line. If you can actually sell something, well, let me back up. If you can actually deliver something by mail anywhere in the world, almost everybody is a direct competition to you. There is no indirect competitions anymore. So now the issue gets to be who's your competition? An individual who's building, uh, they were actually producing con um, construction bricks. And they said to me, I'm the only one in New York State making bricks. I was like, okay. And then I hit the internet. Well, there were five companies that actually make bricks. There happened to be one of those in the state of New York. But because they were a minority, that's the only part of the statement that could be true is that they were the only minority actually making bricks. But they had never looked it up. They just assumed it because they didn't see it. The people they talked to had never heard of it before. But being the only minority that's actually making bricks didn't give you carte blanche on being able to have access to some of the things that you felt you needed to have access to. Because it's not the fact that you're a minority. The fact is you make bricks. And I'm gonna say this for everybody who happens to be going for uh, MWBE certification or whatever. It is just an indicator for you to be able to be listed for contracts which come out of New York State so that they understand who the minorities were that potentially actually quote unquote, got some contracts. There are too many people who are hanging on the MWBE status like that's supposed to get them jobs. You are a business first and foremost. You're going to get jobs because you have the ability to satisfy the contracts. You have competition out there, which you can deliver like anybody else. And oh, by the way, you just also happen to be a minority business as well. And we may later talk about that particular concept, but be very clear. In relative competition, nobody cares if you're a minority or not a minority. They want to know, can you deliver what I need? Can you deliver it? And positioning yourself is always based on public perception. 
Let's be real clear on that. Public perceives what they perceive of you is either what is or what will be. Does everybody get that? Because how do you think people find you? How do you think people deal with you? This is how you beat your competition because somebody's heard about you because you've been talked about on Facebook, Instagram. Okay. Businesses must be aware of the editor's marketing strategy and be very clear on what their pricing is. Because again, you may not be able to provide the lowest price, but you might be able to beat somebody else somewhere else. So is everybody is everybody getting an understanding of it or at least understanding some of which I've actually talked about here? Yes, no, maybe, thumbs up, make a comment. Let me know that people are actually listening, not just on lunch, thank you. Because we can talk about this for another two, three, four hours, but I know Adam's not gonna allow me to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna Get ready to hand it back over to Adam. But again, remember what we're talking about here. These are the five forces you deal with, whether you realize it or not. And you need to be aware of them. And they actually become a part of the business plan that you put together. It's nice to know what these actually are. So with that, I want to thank everybody for tolerating me. And Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Sorry, it took me a second to find my mute button there. <laughs> Mr. McCarley, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, if you can throw me the hosting powers, I will You've got put it. up the, uh, the menu here. So let's see. Uh, let's see here. Cool. Can everybody see my screen? Are we in presentation mode? We can see. Cool. Well, Mr. McCarley, thank you again for a, another wonderful class, another wonderful week. Uh, Porter's Five Forces, I encourage you guys, just as Mr. McCarley has, to do your own research, to do your own self-study on uh, Porter's Five Forces and how that impacts your business. There are plenty of YouTube videos out there. There are plenty of articles out there, uh, podcasts, and um, different uh, things in in. Uh, journals, academic journals, and just ways for you to, to better understand it and get a little more, uh, a deeper grasp on it. So I encourage you, this is, this is real stuff. This is about competition. So keep that in mind. Competition is um, a force that drives the economy. So Mr. McCarley, thank you for that. And next week, we are looking forward to projections and talking about money. And like uh, Michael says, uh, money is a tool. That's what it is. So we're going to learn about how to uh, prepare that tool and, and be ready to uh, get into that learning about expenses and uh, the revenue and how we uh, how to use the tool to the, the best of your ability and, and most efficiently in the meantime we want to feed you so we don't we don't get the chance to get together like we used to uh, before all the madness happened earlier in the spring uh, but we do want to feed you so uh, our options for those in Buffalo are Freddie J's Barbecue and Sunshine Vegan Eats. Real quick on Freddie J's. They were supposed to open today after renovations. They're going to open up next Monday, though. So they'll be, Freddie J's will be out of business uh, until Monday or out of commission until Monday. They're still operational. They're just doing some renovations and cleaning that up. So if you want a voucher to Freddie J's, we can still do that. It'll just be, uh, you're going to be a week behind in being able to go over there. Um, but Sunshine Vegan Eats is uh, open and ready, and uh, and if you're in Rochester, you have El Pilon Criollo and the Arnett Cafe. Those two options are available uh, right now in Rochester. So let us know in the chat right now where you want to go eat. Let us know where uh, you want that voucher to. Let us uh, buy you a meal this week, one day. And um, if you haven't used your vouchers yet from previous classes, please go use those. Um, 
there's no limit on, on you know what days you can use them or anything we just ask that you please use them um, we want to make sure that uh, we're feeding you and providing you with that with that gift with that service rather and a couple more uh, announcements before we get out of here and get back to class um, <laughs> thank you Jida. <laughs> um, the next level week seven is uh, Monday 12 to 1 30 we'll be talking about projections again and how to use money as a tool and how to plan for that um, the small business forum rev up your revenue increasing sales during the holiday season is uh, next Friday October October 30th 11 a.m. to noon be there learn how to increase your uh, your revenue and your sales and your uh, your income in the holiday season as we close out 2020 and uh, change the game a free event for small businesses where we talk about uh, disaster and emergency relief funds that's going to be next Thursday so next Thursday from 3 to 5 30 uh, sponsored by Capital Connect here in Western New York uh, we are a part of that Pathstone is a part of that and we have uh, partners uh, here in uh, Western New York who are going to be helping us put on this great event you guys will hear more about that you'll have the link in your email uh, shortly to register for that it's a free event so please join us for that and then profit and loss our brand new podcast from Pathstone Enterprise Center is up and running our first episode is already up and a uh, second episode will be live on this Wednesday and then every Wednesday from here on out you'll get a new uh, episode of profit and loss so with that, if there are no other questions, comments, concerns, or snide remarks, I will let everybody back to their day and enjoy work, uh, enjoy virtual learning, and enjoy, enjoy virtual classrooms with the kiddos, whatever you're doing. And we will see you uh, next week at 12 o'clock for week seven of boot camp. If you guys have already done six classes, by the way, you're invited to graduation in a few weeks. Uh, send us your bio and your headshot and uh, at Becky at pathstone.org. And we'll make sure we get that in our graduation slideshow. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But, guys, thank you so much. And we will see you next week. All right. Have a good one, guys.